Thank you, Emma. You're amazing. Emma is amazing, and she leads us so well. Puts all of her services together. If you didn't know that, all of her services are organized by her, and she's brilliant at it. And um, we've got some great people doing some cool things. This worship up here was amazing, don't you think? Uh, Daphne, Carson, you guys are amazing. I love you guys, and love being in the presence of Jesus. Wouldn't you agree? It's great. Man, it's good to see everybody. I'm just happy to be here. End of the third week. Isn't it cool? Yes, somebody get excited about that. Week number three is done, and it started to rain. Woo! <laughs> Some, somebody told me, uh, well, I guess I heard this on the news, that we haven't had rain, uh, I think it was like June 12th or something like that was the last time that Seattle has seen rain, you know, so it's like, man, you know, my feet are starting to get dry, and, you know, I, can't, I, need, some, I need some, you know, to walk in a puddle or something, you know, it's like, anyway, so... You know, welcome home. Seattle is back, and it's wet, and it's good, and it's green. It's going to get green. It's going to be a wet weekend, and then, you know, all that's good. Hey, so uh, I'm a, I've got a great topic. I'm really excited about it today, um, and uh, the title of, you know, this whole series that we have been doing, right, is, is, uh, is Kingdom Of, uh, but what I'm talking about today is the kingdom of holiness. Now, I'm going to say it this way. It's the kingdom of holiness. Kingdom of holiness. And you'll get that as I, uh, as I walk through what I have to share with you today. It's on my heart here. So um, anyway, I want, to, I want to start out with about a half a dozen scriptures that I think will kind of uh, give us a little foundation to, uh, on, this, on this subject. And I want, to, I want to just bring those out to your attention and kind of unpack them just a little bit. But uh, the writer of Hebrews, chapter 12, 14, he actually gives us a command. Uh, I mean, he, it's, a, it's a strong word about holiness. And the word, he says, is pursue holiness. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And, and that word pursue indicates uh, that it's, a, it's an effort. It's a, it's a life long, ongoing, it's not a one and done, it is a lifelong, continual process of pursuing holiness, all in, going for it, I'm going to keep on going for it, I'm going to get better every day at it, I'm going to keep on going, I'm not going to quit, not one and done. So, great command, great for us to start off on, we got this holiness, and we're going we're gonna to press in, but where can holiness, where can it be found, and I like and this is why I use this, the, the, the emphasis on kingdom. King, it's found in the kingdom. The kingdom of holiness. Matthew 6, 33. And here's a few other scriptures for you. Seek first. Press in. Seek first. It's an active. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. What things? All these things. I, some people think, well, if I pursue the kingdom of God to his right, righteousness, I'm going to get that really fancy red sports car I always wanted. Well, that would be cool for you, but that's not exactly what this scripture is talking about. Now, if you get one of those, share it with me, please. I'd love to test drive it. It would be so much fun, and I would, I would bless you for it. It would be awesome that you would have it. That would be great that God would bless you with that, or your, you know, God would give you such wisdom that you could make you know, the kind of money to have one of those. But he's not talking about that here. He's not talking about all of these other things that you'll get. It's what kind of things? It's kingdom things. It's righteousness, seek righteousness, and kingdom things will be added to you. Kingdom things. Luke 17, verse 20. The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold... The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So the kingdom, it's a both and situation. Both and. It's, it's already and it's not yet. We anticipate God's kingdom and we're looking forward to that. The kingdom of heaven and eternal life with Jesus. And I want to tell you something. I can't wait for that to happen. I am looking forward to spend an eternity with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. To be with Jesus forever is the, will be like, okay, this is incredible. But that hasn't happened yet. One day, it will happen. 
So the kingdom of God is not coming with signs and wonders to be observed. You know, maybe there's some signs, and the Bible talks about signs in the end times, and all of that is great. But that's not what we're talking about. The kingdom, it's, it's already here. It's in the midst of us. It's an already, but not yet. It's already here, but it's going to be amazing. Romans 14, verse 12, the kingdom of God it's not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Spirit. It's not about our physical life, this eating and drinking, although we enjoy the pleasures of life. But it's about righteousness. It's not about our physical life as much as it is about our spiritual life. Our spiritual life. And then finally, John 3.3. 3. Unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born twice, we're born into this world. Flesh, you are all here, so you were born. Born once. Here we are. In this world. But we're born a second time of the Spirit. Your birth is important, but your spiritual birth is ultimately most important to God. And the first step of holiness is starting a walk with Jesus, unless a person is born again. So I grew up in a uh, pretty traditional pastor's home. I am a third-generation Pentecostal preacher, fourth-generation uh, Christian. Uh, and I won't go into the whole story of my, my uh, background, although it's just been documented in a, in a recent book that just came out. Uh, it's on Amazon, actually, and I won't even share that unless you want to know about it later. But uh, a person actually documented my family line, which is incredible, and uh, uh, some amazing stories of God's goodness. But I grew up in this traditional family home. And when I say traditional, uh, I mean traditional in, in all of the sense of the word. I mean, my parents did not engage or allow our home to engage in anything that portrayed the world. And when I mean that, I mean it very sincerely. Uh, there was never secular music played in our home. There was never alcohol consumed in our home. There was never uh, swear words spoken in our home. Not even close. Not even, you know, not nothing. I mean, what, I mean our, like we could, we could not use the word stupid in our home. I'm serious. The word idiot was not allowed in our home. You could not call your brother or sister in my... I mean, I could not say that to my, to my brother and sister, even though I might have thought it once or twice. And I, you know, I grew up in that environment. And, um, you know, coming to Northwest, I came to Northwest here and, and, uh, and still today have a lot of um, uh, friends who grew up in, in, in very traditional homes like that. And when I was at Northwest here... Uh, it was interesting how many of my friends actually, uh, coming from homes, pastoral friends that I engage with, actually went through um, some real se seasons of rebellion, really rebelled. Uh, they rebelled against the church because of the, the legalism that they found in that, uh, the formalities, the rules that they felt that boxed them in. And, uh, but I am, for me, very grateful today, and, and I say it sincerely and honestly, I'm thankful for my parents. I just celebrated my dad's 90th birthday on Labor Day, and uh, just to hear him again, just so eloquently, 90 years old, talk about taking the risk of his life for the kingdom of God. It was just compelling as he talked about uh, the important things in life, and just had this moment with uh, this horde of people, uh, six, five kids, one adopted kid, child, all of their children and now great-grandchildren. I think there's 28 great-grandchildren. It's just a massive group of people. But it allowed, I'm thankful for my parents, it allowed me to see their life of holiness and how that played out in the, in the way that they embraced culture. Culture. And I'll tell you, honestly, at times as a young person, it was a bummer. You know, I wanted to be accepted by my peers, um, I wanted to be uh, accepted, embraced by them, and, and uh, those times I lost friendships over, the, over my home situation, what I was allowed to do and not to do. 
because my home was different. It was different, very much so. But as I watched my parents, here's the, here was the difference. It wasn't about rules. It was about having a healthy view of holiness. Now, I could unpack that and take a time there, but I'll stop right there for the sake of time. It was a healthy view of holiness. There are two kingdoms, again, emphasizing the word kingdom, that I think we really have to get a, a picture of this. Two kingdoms that we deal with. And we're born once, like I said, and we're born twice. John 3, 3, born again. We're born once physically into this world, into this world that we, this culture that we have to deal with. We're born in it. My family um, is mostly from Canada. Uh, Brenda's family is mostly from Canada. All of my relatives are, are uh, in Canada with the exception of my immediate siblings and my dad. Uh, all of my cousins and uncles are all there. Brenda, the same thing. All of her, her mom lives there, all of her cousins. Uh, and in Canada, we talk to them oftentimes. They, you know, in Canada, they deal with a sort of a socialist sort of a government. And they look at us in the United States and go, you guys have got this democracy. It's awesome. We would like to live there, you know. And, you know, it's like, well, <laughs> right now it's like an interesting place to live, you know. You sure? You know, and, but, but the, and, it, and I'm not making it about politics, but here's the thing. You know, either way, they're governed by people. This world we're living in. You know, some good, some not so good. Some governments are flat out evil. Look at what's going on in Afghanistan right now. You know, if you're a good citizen, things can go well for you, but at the same time, things are not guaranteed. You know, you pay taxes and you vote and you do your part to live in this imperfect system made by man, governed by man, and enforced by man, and it is imperfect. It is imperfect. And I'm not just talking about government. I'm talking about, you know, the social constructs that we deal with in our, in our world. It's broken. And Jesus said in John 17, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. We, we, we've got to deal with this. We've got to live here. We've got to understand the culture. But there's another world. There's another world. And we can't avoid this world we're in. As a matter of fact, I believe, for me, God has placed me here to be the representative of a better system. So in a world governed mostly by evil, we, we stay engaged and vigilant but there is another world there is another kingdom one that is not governed by people it's governed by God and we call him Lord because he is the ruler of this kingdom it's not it's not perfect as a matter of fact it is imperfect because it is made up of imperfect believers but it is ruled by a perfect holy king he knows all he sees all, he understands all, and he is over all. While some may not believe it, he is even over the kingdoms and nations of this world. We may not fully understand the way our Lord rules his kingdom, and we often have questions, but, it, but he is patient with our limited understanding. The king of this kingdom is deeply interested in everyone in the kingdom to the degree that he hears our darkest pain and rejoices when our hearts are glad. In this kingdom, everyone is equal and no one is left out. Each person has access to the king without interference of protocols or positioning. The very nature of this king is holy and his spirit is holy and without a trace of sin. The king's ultimate desire is for those who choose this kingdom to live holy, wholesome, life-giving, productive lives, enabling others to know and understand the love and freedom that is available for everyone who would choose to live in this kingdom. And ultimately, when this life is over, we will spend eternal life with this life-giving king. Come on, somebody. the world I want to live in. <sighs> Got to do this thing. Woo. Well, I'm loving this thing. 
This is where I'm at. So holiness starts at spiritual birth. How? John 3, 3. Be born again. As soon as you accept Christ, you are holy. As soon as you accept Christ. The Holy Spirit is present in your life, and you are embraced as a child of the King. And as soon as you embrace the King with a repentant heart and ask him to, in, to enable you to live a holy life, you are holy enough to be part of this kingdom. Cool start of the journey. Now some would say, some would say, and they choose to believe that we become holy enough to enter this kingdom. That in some way, we have to become holy by our effort. I have to do something right or, or not do something wrong. I, I had a, a, kind of a funny situation one time. Uh, a student actually made an appointment with me, came and visited my office, sat down, and uh, I'm like, okay, you, know, you, want, you want to talk. Well, let's talk. What, what, what would you like to talk about? And so he starts out, and he says this. He says, my blankety-blank pastor, you know what the words, you know what that means, blankety-blank? You guys, yeah, yeah, you got that, right? My blankety-blank pastor said that I can use blankety-blank adult language and still go to heaven. I was like, hey, interesting thought. You're like, okay, where's this going, you know, I'm like, oh. And then, he, and then he goes, can you not handle my adult language? Do you struggle with adult conversations? Well, you know, we had an interesting conversation in my office today. It was that day. It was, it was an interesting conversation. You know, thankfully, though, I am not the judge of who does or doesn't enter God's kingdom. <laughs> you know? It's not me. You know, if that's what you choose to do, well, if you want to get really close to this line, you can. But I'm over here. This is where I choose to be. You know, why would you want to hold on to something that is part of a broken and defective world? You know, why even go there? Why? When this is so awesome. The desire to be holy starts when we accept Christ. This quote from Jerry Bridges, he wrote the book, The Pursuit of Holiness. He said, when the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit comes into our lives at our salvation, he comes to make us holy in practice. If there is not then at least a yearning in our hearts to live a holy life pleasing to God, we need to seriously question whether our faith in Christ is genuine. It is true that this desire for holiness may be only a spark at the beginning, but that spark should grow till it becomes a flame, a desire to live a life holy, pleasing to God. True salvation brings with it a desire to be made holy. You know, the, the idea of holiness for many brings to mind, you know, the idea of, you know, some conservative style of dress or, you know, some kind of outward appearance that, you know, in some ways is, is you know, I don't know, like a, you know, bund hair. Or I, I don't know, long, you know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I don't know, I don't know. I don't even know, you know. <laughs> Brenda and I... Um, Clint, you'll appreciate this because you're, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Clint, Clint is a really good friend in many years here. We've had life together before Northwest. Brenda and I worked in a ministry position for a few years. <laughs> um, the foundation of the organization was extreme holiness from where it came from, uh, from an outward appearance. And uh, women, women, the women wore skirts and nylons and limited makeup. That was kind of the dress code. Men were in shirts and ties and jackets. And, and uh, 
you know, Brenda, my wife, she would, she would make lunch appointments with her girlfriends and, uh, you know, and she would leave the office. But before she would leave, she would go into the women's restroom and she would put on her normal clothes. <laughs> yeah. She'd put on her normal clothes, you know. And so then she'd go have lunch and then she'd come back and put back on her, her uh, you know, conservative attire. And the funny part of it for me was, at the time, I was kind of acting as this sort of uh, department manager, if you will, and uh, um, I, the other women in the, on the floor where we worked would see her leave the office in her, you know, regular clothes out of uniform, and so they would call HR, hey, there's a, there's a, there's a woman who's not dressed right. <laughs> I'm serious. I am not lying to you. There's a woman not dressed right. We saw her leaving the building, and she needs to be corrected. And so my phone would ring. <laughs> we have just received a report that Brenda Rasmussen has been <laughs> not dressing right appropriately, so, and that needs to be corrected in your department. Will you please have a conversation with her? Yes, I will. Thank you. Brenda, what are you doing? Change at the restaurant. Anyway. But we get into this sort of pharisaical danger. You know, following this idea of holiness puts us in danger of becoming like the Pharisees with a list of do's and don'ts and, you know, self-righteous attitude. For some, it's about how you look, you know, your mannerisms or whatever. And for others, it's, you know, this unattainable perfection which only fosters delusion, discouragement, uh, and discouragement about sin. So what is holiness? To be holy is to be morally blameless, to be separated from sin, and consecrated or grafted, I love that term, grafted into God. Grafted. In John 15, 5, this is a great passage of scripture. Jesus says, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you will remain in me, if you will stay grafted, that's a great term. If you will remain in me, be grafted into me, and I am grafted into you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This word grafting, it's, a, it's an agrarian horticultural technique where tissues of, of plants are joined by means of tissue regeneration to continue their growth together. It's like, it's like you could do well by yourself. Sure. You want to do okay? You know, the Bible says, it's actually, uh, it's a great scripture, you know, uh, 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 one, one strand can be easily broken, but three strands, no one can separate it, grafted. So, you know, you could try to do it by yourself, but what if you partner with the Holy Spirit and you really align yourself with the Holy Spirit and you become grafted? And you allow this vine that Jesus talks about to grow together. Do you know how strong that becomes? As you grow, grafted. I am the vine. Jesus' words in the original language indicate that he is the true He's the real vine. Connecting to the real vine is the only way to produce real fruit. Real fruit comes from the real source. You know, people will try to emulate people, other people. And I think that's great. I think it's wonderful to have mentors. I have mentors. I do. I have people who speak into my life. And I think it's really, really, really important to do that. But here's the thing I want you to hear. While it's great to have mentors, they cannot generate real holiness in you. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that when you become grafted together. Only he can do that. So when a person is connected, grafted, intertwined so much that the very persona, the very person looks more like the vine 
What happens? Fruit. Fruit starts to grow. You can't help it. You can't. When you're connected to the vine, things grow. Fruit grows, and it will happen. The vine is holy, and it grows only one kind of fruit. Holy Spirit fruit. Holy fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. It describes it so well. There's only one fruit, but there's nine parts. One fruit, holy, but there are nine parts. And it starts out with love. Love. It's the first one mentioned because it is the most important one. It really is. It's the most important one. Ask yourself, ask yourself this. Do I sacrifice my time, resources, and talents to help people in need? Do I love? Joy. What about joy? Do I have inner happiness that is not dependent on people, circumstances, or things? Joy. Peace. Do I have harmony with all people, even those who are different from me in the way they think, act, or believe? Patience. Do I put up with people even when I'm severely tired or experiencing tension? Kindness. Do I engage in thoughtful deeds for people, especially those I do not know? Goodness. Do I, do I show generosity to people even if I think I can't afford it? Faithfulness. Am I trustworthy and reliable? Do I keep my word and respect people's time and resources? Gentleness. Do I display a character of meekness, which is described as strength under control? That's meekness, similar to humility. Do I display a character of meekness and empathy towards those in need or who are hurting? Gentleness. Self-control, do I have victory over selfish desires? Do my finances, my internet use, my sexual fantasies, or my cell phone, do they have control of me? Self-control. You know, what if, what, if we just, what if we just picked one of those aspects over this week. What if you just picked one? I'm, I'm going to work on love this week. I'm going I'm to sacrifice my time. And then the next week, what if, you picked, what if you picked joy? You worked on that for a week. I'm just going to, no matter, no matter, um, <laughs> this happened to come to me a couple uh, weeks ago. I was in my devotions and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I was uh, reading on forgiveness and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, choose right now to forgive throughout this entire day every person that potentially might wrong you or hurt you. No matter what they say or no matter what they do, right now, 6.30 in the morning, forgive them. I was like, okay, God. And I lived that entire day, and actually it bled into the next day, and it's still actually in my spirit. Now, weeks later, because I, I, I chose that day. It was like the Holy Spirit. You know, if you just start that process, joy and peace and patience and kindness, just, just start working on, you know, and, and then after you get nine weeks down, start over at love. And just keep, I'm going to focus on love. Do you realize how much fruit would be produced in your life? How holy, how, ho how, how, how more how Christ-like we would become as we become grafted. Grafted. All right. Here's what I want to do. I've got a few minutes. I want you to talk to me. How has this impacted you right now? 
What are your thoughts? Not everybody at once, because that would be overwhelming. Right there. Stand up and speak really loud so everybody can hear you. Yeah. You know, off the top of my head, it would be probably NIV, but I'd have to go back and look. I usually do. I, I would bounce, I bounce around from NIV, New King James, ESV. I, I do bounce around. You know, my bad, I probably should have put it up there. That would have been a better thing for me to do. But Oh, you're so good. What a good student you are. Oh, my word. God. Yeah, no kidding. Note to self. Come on. Yeah. Okay, wait, I can't hear you. So you need to, you need to stand up and speak really loud so everybody can hear. Oh, good. Release from passiveness. Yeah, come on. Come on. Yeah. Okay, you're all dismissed. <laughs> it's like broken me up right now. <laughs> Are you kidding? Wow. If there was no other purpose for this chapel than what you just said right there. Thank you, Jesus. That's all I can say, honestly. Wow. I see a hand right back there in the middle. Yep, sure. Stand up and speak really loud. So good. Wow, so good. I know you do, yeah. And we've talked about this. It's good. So good. Joseph, that's awesome. Okay, I see a hand right here. Stand up and really like, yep, yeah. That's so good. Oh, I love that. That's well said. Anybody up in the balcony looking up there? Last chapel, we had a couple people up in the balcony. I don't want to miss anybody up there. All right. I'll say, I see one more hand right back here, and then we'll, let you, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end. Go ahead.
Yeah, welcome. right yeah that's it yeah 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 good word Are you closing us in? Let me pray for you guys. And then it's coming to close us. Jesus, thank you so much for your word today. I pray, God, that um, we would really seek you with all of our heart. We would. We would seek you. Seek first the kingdom. Seek you with all of our heart. And as we do that, I pray it really would come alive in our heart and our lives that we're grafted into the word, we're grafted into this relationship with Jesus. The fruit of our life would become undeniable to this world that is broken and crazy and needing so much hope. Help us to be representatives of the truth. Thank you, Lord, for these moments that we share together. In Jesus' name, amen.